Good evening. It's a joy to welcome you to another one of our midweek Bible studies. Uh, this evening, we're in Acts chapter 2, finishing up that chapter, the third in our series of recently begun uh, lessons in the study of Acts. And our text for today is considerably shorter than last week's, but certainly no less powerful in its message. Uh, today, we're going to be studying the passage that provides the fullest description of what life was like in the early church of Jerusalem. Our lesson begins this evening in verse 42 with the third person personal pronoun, they. Uh, to whom does Luke refer here as they? Well, clearly he's referencing the 3,000 recently uh, baptized believers who responded to his sermon on the day of Pentecost, in addition to the 120 who had gathered to await uh, the promised Holy Spirit. New Testament professor Scott McKnight describes these new converts as being all in when it came to the question of their spiritual formation, that is, of growing in their newfound faith. The difference, he notes, though, is that while we in our day emphasize this more on an individual basis, the early church was geared toward learning how to practice these spiritual disciplines and grow in their faith as a community of believers. And I wonder how that difference in one's approach to spiritual formation might either positively or negatively infect uh, impact the outcome of the discipleship process. I think uh, done together in a group uh, certainly has lasting effects. Well, what components formed a part of their spiritual formation training? Luke identifies four elements of their discipleship process in verse 42, and he prefaces all of these by saying they were continually devoting themselves to these four activities or disciplines. You know, that's the identical phrase that he used earlier in Acts 1.14, to describe their ongoing commitment to praying. They continued in prayer. Other translations indicate that they continued steadfastly, they persevered, or they spent their time, or they continued to hold uh, firmly to these four practices. And the language denotes that this wasn't a casual approach to growing in their faith, but an all-hands-on-deck type of commitment on the part of the congregation. Well, the first element of their spiritual formation was that of spending time listening to the teaching of the apostles. This step was fundamental in their understanding of what the Lord expected of them as his followers. The apostles taught with the authority of Jesus himself, sharing the truths that he had first taught them. And Paul opens practically each of his epistles to the various churches by identifying himself first as a bondservant and as an apostle of Christ. The word apostle means sent one and speaks to the fact that these, as we saw last week, had been commissioned and sent by the Lord to proclaim the gospel to all. Their teaching was authoritative because it was derived from Jesus himself. And Paul will say as much in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, and in Ephesians 3, verses 4 through 5. Much of what they had taught, uh, of what they did teach, obviously, has been preserved for us in the pages of the New Testament, especially the writings of Paul and Peter and John. But at that time, of course, they had no scriptures other than the Old Testament to study. So they spent time listening to the apostles and, and heeding their teaching. The second element Luke notes that characterized the early church was their commitment to fellowship. Uh, the Greek word koinonia is that which is translated as fellowship, and we're pretty familiar with that Greek term. In fact, it even appears in Webster's Dictionary. Uh, yes, the, the Greek word koinonia is there, and he defines it as intimate spiritual communion and participative sharing in a common religious commitment and spiritual community. Note those words that begin with CO, communion, common, commitment, and community all point to this shared life that they had together. In fact, the New International Reader's Version of the Bible actually expresses this phrase as they shared their lives together. You know, a, a phrase that's become popular in recent years in church lingo is doing life together. Small groups talk about that, doing life together. And that's in essence what these believers did. The New Testament believers were committed to a common way of life, so much so that we read in Acts chapter 9-2 that Saul, as he was still known at that point, was bound for Damascus to seek out any belonging to the way to bring them bound to Jerusalem. And repeated references to those of the way are found elsewhere in Acts. In Acts 19.9, 19.23, 22.4, 24.14, and 24.22. And that repeated use of the phrase, the way, indicated that the Christian way of life of these followers of Jesus was so distinctive that to merely refer to them as those of the way indicated that they were Christians and Christ followers. 
Now, we Baptists have come to believe that food is a necessary part of any gathering we identify as fellowship. We, we jokingly laugh about that, of course, but certainly genuine fellowship entails more than just sharing food together. But at the same time, we note that the third component that Luke identifies here as being a vital component of their spiritual formation in the early church was that of breaking of the breaking of bread. And while some argue that that phrase meant exclusively their participation in the Lord's Supper together, others rightfully maintain, I believe, that it likely refers to the broader practice of sharing meals with one another. And in all likelihood, as others have suggested, the Lord's Supper was regularly observed as a part of the ordinary meals that these believers were sharing together. The fourth element that was incorporated into their spiritual formation was a commitment to prayers, or literally, or to prayers, uh, or literally to the prayers. These prayers could have been their own personal times of prayer, or more likely, times when the whole church gathered together to pray. Apparently, some were continuing to gather at the previously prescribed times of prayer that the other Jews observed as based on the Old Testament practices. In our lesson that we're going to look at next week and from Acts chapter 3, we'll, we'll look at Peter's second sermon that follows him and John going up uh, to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, uh, where they heal a lame beggar. New Testament professor Scott McKnight notes that for a first century Jew, the prayers would have meant morning, mid-afternoon, and evening times of prayer. Well, what began at Pentecost evidently continued for a considerable time afterward, according to the verses that followed. Uh, Curtis Vaughn, New Testament professor from Southwestern Seminary, who I have quoted previously, uh, speaks of the afterglow of Pentecost, and he indicates four broad categories or statements about these early Christians and their fellowship together. The first description of their fellowship in verse 43 includes two elements, a sense of awe or fear that involved reverence, and also the power that was exhibited by the apostles in the forms of the signs and wonders that they were performing. The imperfect tense of the verb that is used here means that that sense of awe or fear was continuing to be felt by these Christians. And some suggest that Peter's preaching and the accompanying conviction of sin that it had prompted contributed to this sense of reverent awe. That sense of awe was also probably prolonged and heightened as the apostles demonstrated God's power at work in them through his Holy Spirit by the miracles and signs that they were displaying. As I mentioned, next week we're going to read of Peter and John healing the lame beggar who began walking and leaping and praising God. Uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 6 through 8 that will be a part of what we'll look at next uh, next Sunday or next week, I should say. But the effect of this miracle of healing was palpable among the onlookers. and The crowd was filled with awe and wonder and amazement at what they were witnessing. You know, we referenced also last week, John 14, 12, where Jesus said, greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. We mentioned the 3,000 who were gathered together in response uh, to Peter's preaching and the preaching of the other uh, apostles and, and believers on that day with tongues that they had never learned. Uh, John 14, 12 is that reference. And again, I think these miracles that continue to be performed are a fulfillment of that uh, statement by Jesus as well. Verse 44 introduces us to a second characteristic of the early church in this afterglow of Pentecost. They were marked by unity or oneness and love. They spent time together as fellow believers, and they openly shared all that they had with one another. We see here tremendous love and generosity as they sought to meet the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ. They were living together in a genuine spirit of community. Now, some have argued that this represents an early form of communism. But verse 45 clarifies this wasn't some imposed system of equality or uniformity by some higher power or a government. Rather, it was a voluntary selling of property and possessions by those who had resources and assets in order to meet the needs of those less fortunate among them, those lacking what they needed to live. And as needs arose within the community, those with adequate resources sold what they had to provide for those who didn't have enough to survive. And the verb tenses here, once again, are in the imperfect tense, indicating this was an ongoing practice as different circumstances and needs arose rather than a one-time mass selling of private property by the owners of these resources. Their continued fellowship is highlighted in verse 46 as well that describes a third characteristic of this afterglow of Pentecost, that being their practice of daily worship. The opening phrases of this verse reveal three aspects about how they engaged in worship. First, they met regularly. 
The phrases day by day or every day or continuing daily are all ways that different Bible translations express the fact that not a day passed without these believers gathering for worship together. Second characteristic, they met for worship in the temple. In all likelihood, as is indicated by subsequent references in Acts 3.11 and Acts 5.12, the place that they gathered for worship in the temple was Solomon's Colonnade, which ran along the east side of the outer court. Their unity in worship is highlighted once more when Luke says that they met together with one accord or with one mind, united in spirit or with singleness of purpose. Uh, the unity of the Jerusalem church in these early days is striking and certainly a challenge to us to seek the same oneness of heart and unity in our fellowship today. Verse 46 includes this as a third element of or includes as well a third element of their worship and fellowship when it specifies that this activity took place from house to house and that the believers were taking their meals together. Now, it would have been problematic for them to try to eat the meals together in the temple, so they opted for the most logical solutioning, solution to this by opening their homes to one another to share in these communal gatherings to eat with one another. And as noted above, the observance of the Lord's Supper was probably a part of these shared meal times together. But we shouldn't overlook either the atmosphere that pervaded these shared meals. Depending on one's translation, we read that they did so with gladness and singleness of heart, with joy and generous hearts, or with joyful and sincere or humble hearts. Uh, they, these weren't sad or somber occasions at all, but times of gladness and joy as they genuinely enjoyed being with one another and mutually encouraging each other. Once again, I think we can learn some important lessons from the New Testament church in those early months of its existence about how to live together in harmony. As we come to the concluding verse of our focal passage today, we note as well that they continued in nonstop praising of God. The day-by-day -day phrase that introduced verse 46 is still in effect as it, as it concerns their daily practice of glorifying God and extolling Him for all of His attributes. You know, and the Psalms can be a great source of inspiration and encouragement for us as we seek to enrich and expand our own practice of praising and worshiping God for who he is and for all that he has done. The impact of this contagious fellowship on its environment in its practices of praying and sharing and meeting one another's needs and worshiping to God, God together was absolutely remarkable. Luke informs us that they were having or enjoying goodwill and favor with all the people. Now, there would, of course, be a later negative backlash on the part of the religious establishment when their numbers and influence continued to grow. But among the common people, they were viewed favorably. After what is there not to like about a group that expresses genuine love and cares for its members and doing so so generously and sacrificially? The final statement about their fellowship involves their continued growth. We read that the Lord was adding daily to their number those who were being saved. Once again, the Greek verb is in the imperfect tense, indicating this was an ongoing activity, adding daily. Uh, through their testimony, their lifestyle, their worship, people were being drawn to Jesus Christ and were professing their faith in him for salvation daily. Could it be that our failure to see folks coming to Christ daily or even weekly is because we as a church don't exhibit these same winsome qualities and attitudes as those that characterize the early church in Jerusalem? I wonder. If so, what concrete steps can we personally take to create a fellowship that draws others like a magnet toward our Savior? Uh, the, the early church certainly constitutes an example and a challenge for us as believers today to mirror the type of life that they lived in which people were coming to faith daily in Christ. Thank you for joining me this evening. I invite you to pray with me as we conclude our study. Gracious Father, we thank you for this powerful passage from Acts chapter 2 where Luke describes for us what life was like in the early church in Jerusalem. And we can't help but, but be, in some sense, envious of the atmosphere that exists. But Lord, we recognize at the same time it was the filling of your Holy Spirit that enabled them to live this way. And so, Father, we recognize to the extent that we are not living in that same kind of climate today. Uh, we have to confess that we have uh, far too often tried to do things in our own power rather than depending upon the indwelling Holy Spirit to enable us to accomplish these disciplines and, and practice them daily of, of fellowship, of prayer, of genuinely meeting the needs of others, of 
worshiping you daily and worshiping with one another. Lord, I pray that we could incorporate these disciplines into our lives as the early church did so that we might see the same spirit of revival and folks coming to faith in Christ as, as they experienced in their day and time. Lord, bless us this week as we attempt to do just that. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me again this evening for another one of our midweek Bible studies. Look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. Uh, Matt will be preaching in Blake's absence and wrapping up the battles sermon series that we've been looking at. God bless you. Hope to see you then. Bye for now.